Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'd like to introduce Robert Sarvis, the Libertarian candidate for governor of the state of Virginia. Uh, Mr. Sarvis is 37 years old, a Virginia native, and has experience in both the public and private sector, including as an entrepreneur, software engineer, and lawyer. He holds degrees from Harvard and University of Cambridge in mathematics, a JD from New York University, and a master's in economics from George Mason University. He has been featured nationally in the Washington Post and Huffington Post, and is a serious third party contender, polling above 10% in some polls. Um, so without any further ado, here is Mr. Sarvis. All right, well thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, my name is Robert Sarvis, I'm the Libertarian candidate for governor. It's very nice to be here. Uh, Charlottesville is one of the places that I have quite a bit of support, and it's one of the places I've been coming to throughout the campaign, and it's very nice to see the support growing in both the UVA community and outside in the, uh, in the Charlottesville community in Albemarle County. So why did I get in this race? Uh, I think it's obvious to many of you that there are a lot of problems with government at state, federal, and local levels, and the Republican and Democratic parties really aren't searching for real solutions. Oftentimes it seems like they don't even understand the problems. And the Libertarian Party has an opportunity to talk about the things that are most important in government. The most important things in government are that government respects your freedom, both your economic freedom and your personal liberty. And, it's and everything that government does should be consistent with the rule of law. And I'll talk about several reasons why the rule of law is so important throughout this, uh, throughout my introductory talks, um, but would be happy to also uh, explore that a little more with you in the Q&A session. But why is it so important that we have these, these uh, principles being talked about in a campaign? It's because freedom actually works. And when you have a system that's built on letting people live their lives like they want to live them, pursue happiness as they define it, you get a better, more prosperous, more peaceful society. So government has a legitimate role in protecting our rights, but in the first instance we should be able to engage with each other voluntarily through contract, respect each other's property, we have a tort system. That creates a basic framework in which we are able to work together, to cooperate together, compete in, this, in, the, in the economic sphere, and produce prosperity through competition. The Republicans and Democrats seem to have gotten away from that idea, and they want to tell you how to, how to, how to run your business. Now, there's a, there's a legitimate role for government regulation, but what happens is that as soon as there is a regulatory regime, all too often, businesses, corporations, industries, capture the regulatory process and use it to insulate themselves from competition. Regulation ends up protecting private profits rather than the public interest. And we suffer as consumers, we, co we suffer in multiple ways. Things not only cost more, but there's less innovation, there's less market entry from innovators and entrepreneurs, and it's harder for us to make the technological improvements that are gonna uh, make our lives better. So I'll just give you a few examples of this. Uh, my sister is a radiologist, and if she wanted to open a new service, buy an MRI machine, hire some technicians, and uh, offer her services to the public, she would have to get a certificate of public need, prove to a state board of health that there's a need for, public, for more services in the area where she uh, wants to do business. Her competitors can lobby the government to keep her out of business. Now that's obviously not a good system. That's not one that has freedom of entry and exit. That's not one that has open and competitive uh, markets. It's a Soviet-style centralized bureaucracy where you have to get permission before you can do business. The way it should work is that there's no more evidence we need that there's a public need for services than that an entrepreneur is willing to put her money at risk, put her capital at risk, put her time into, a, into creating a, a, a new business, a new offering. If there isn't a need, she won't make a profit and she'll go out of business. And that's how it's supposed to work. But we have to have open and competitive markets in order to have all the benefits we get from rule of law capitalism. 
and the departure away from open and competitive markets. When industries and big corporations and market incumbents are allowed to use the government to insulate themselves from competition, insulate themselves from new entrants, that's getting away from the rule of law. That's getting away from economic freedom. And it permeates every area of the economy, every area of our legal code and our tax code and our regulatory code. I'll give you another example. Uh, Tesla, the electric car company, has a showroom in Tyson's Corner. But they can't sell cars there. And the reason they can't sell cars there is because we have a law that says that you have to have a middleman. Uh, why do we have this law? Well, it's probably because most car manufacturers are out of state and most dealership, dealership uh, owners are in state. And they don't, you know, the in state folks lobby for these types of laws to protect their business. And so manufacturers aren't allowed to sell directly to customers. Uh, and you have to, if you want to buy a Tesla car, you have to uh, order it online. And that increases the cost of car ownership for all of us because we have to have, we have to go through that middleman to purchase one. But this, this, is, this, is, this is not something that, that these are isolated uh, examples. It permeates every area of the economy, every area of our regulatory and tax code. Uh, you know, public, the licensure system is uh, totally out of whack where the professions have used the licensing system to essentially cartelize all the professions. And if we could move away from either reform it entirely or in many cases eliminate it, move to a voluntary certification type system, you get all the informational uh, benefits without any of the cartelizing um, costs. So th this is something where we actually have to go through the entire tax and regulatory code and focus on, in order to get our economy moving again, have it more dynamic, be able to put people back to work, be able to move people from fa failing industries into rising industries, we have to have an open and competitive marketplace in every industry. Let's talk about education reform. This is another area where uh, you know, regulations have, and, and public services have uh, become very static. And even as there are more and more resources online, uh, educational services are becoming more costly. There's a lot of administrative bloat. All the incentives are in the wrong place, pointing in the wrong direction in the public sector. So our schools are run for the benefit of politicians and bureaucrats. There's a lot of administrative bloat. Uh, Virginia has something like 1.8 administrators per teacher in K through 12 system statewide. A generation or two ago, it was the, the reverse. If we could just get down to parity, one administrator per teacher, you could save on the order of a billion dollars a year, state and local governments combined. That's a lot of money. That happens to be approximately what the tax increase for the transportation bill was. So when you don't have uh, people who understand the problem, people who are, who are legislating and governing in the public interest, you get no prioritization of spending and you get tax increases any time we need money for something like transportation. Even in transportation, we have uh, a kind of a ridiculous regime that is incredibly inefficient, incredibly wasteful. So we have, just think of the way we do things. We spend so much, we send so much money to Richmond, and then a, a centralized bureaucracy through a totally opaque decision-making process uh, makes decisions about which projects are going to go forward throughout the state. This is. This is a, a system that is very prone to lobbying by developers and other concentrated interests. And it's very hard for individual citizens, the people, to influence that uh, process in a, in a useful manner. So one of the things that ought to be done is not have so much money go through Richmond, empower the local communities where local authorities are more accountable to the people and where they have more local knowledge about the relative merits of various projects. We also in transportation have moved even further away from the idea that users should pay for their use of road <coughs> and other transportation infrastructure. Look at what we did with uh, moving away from a gas tax and moving towards increases in the sales tax. The sales tax has nothing to do with transportation and road usage. Um, if you live in, say, Hampton Roads, you're a poor family, you might not even have a car, but you're paying a vastly increased sales tax, including the geographic surcharge, the surtax, and um, you know, that's a horribly regressive tax, and there's not even a, a there's, there's no certainty that that money is actually even going to go to transportation, because what is the biggest driver of long-term state spending? It's healthcare, and especially if you uh, believe, if you, if you support uh, expanding the Medicaid program without reforming the system, 
you're just going to get, uh, and then the federal government, if that, if the 90% uh, subsidies are, are not there in the future, and I don't think they're going to be, then all of a sudden, where is the money going to have to come from? And I submit to you that a lot of that's going to come out of the, the money that was supposed to go to transportation. So, so I've talked about uh, economic uh, reform, school choice. Uh, I, was, I was talking about the schools, and I wanted to also talk about the fact, I, I mentioned administrative bloat, but I also want to talk about education, school choice programs, and creating a open and competitive marketplace in educational services. So most of you guys out, in, out there are young, uh, and you are going to have a very different career path from uh, you know, your parents and, their, and your grandparents. And that's because the economy is so much more dynamic now. By the time you're my age, uh, I'm 37, you will likely have changed jobs several times, possibly changed career paths a couple times. And you, know, you have to go where the, the opportunity is. You have to constantly be maintaining your skill set to make sure you're marketable in a new economy. And that's something that we have to make sure you're prepared for in K through 12 education and higher education. And so this is something that we're not doing a good job of right now, in part because we're, we're subsidizing a lot of the institutions that have been around for 100 years or more, 20th century model of education, when uh, you, know, you, have to, you have to be educated for the 21st century. Education costs are going through the roof. People come out with a lot of debt, even as uh, there are a lot more cheaper methods of delivering educational services. So the way that we have to move forward is to stop subsidizing the institutions of the last century and to start making sure that our, through an open and competitive marketplace, every other, every other industry in the economy that has a competitive marketplace creates innovation that reduces costs and improves quality. That's what we have to have in educational services. That's one of the reasons why I support school choice programs in K through 12. And uh, you know, by empowering parents, giving them control over the money that's spent on their kids, you're not investing in the public school system only. You're, you're, you're investing in the people who become consumers and can go out into a marketplace and bring new suppliers in who are going to be innovative uh, in, in delivery of educational services. Uh, let's talk about also uh, marriage equality. I think that this is a very important issue as a matter of freedom and equality where if you're going to have the government in the business of giving legal privileges on the basis of a personal relationship, you ought to make it available to same-sex couples on an equal basis. Uh, I, I go around the state and find people who aren't even aware that uh, interracial marriages were illegal 50 years ago. I'm the only candidate in the governor's race whose marriage was once illegal in the state. And I think, it's, I think it just goes to show the Santa Ana quote that if you're ignorant of history, you're condemned to repeat it. And I think a lot of the arguments against uh, recognizing same-sex marriage on an equal basis uh, are, are many of the same arguments that were made 50 years ago. They're bad then and they're bad today. Uh, another issue I think that is really important is drug reform, uh, especially legalizing marijuana. One of the, one of the uh, major, a, a crucial issue is, is the war on drugs not simply because it's a freedom issue, uh, that's an important aspect to it, but it's also, it also touches on so many other social pathologies that we have. So if you, if you think about not only the amount of spending we do on enforcement costs and incarceration, there's also the loss of economic activity when you criminalize people with a, um, and render them unemployable. It also oftentimes takes fathers out of the household, young men, uh, so that Young kids are growing up without fathers in the household. It makes it very hard to, uh, to get out of a cycle of poverty, generational cycle of poverty when you have that uh, going on. The racial disparities cause huge problems in inner cities. The, the lack of equality in the way that drug laws are enforced is a major problem. When I mentioned I was gonna talk about the rule of law uh, in, in multiple contexts. This is one where it really matters too. If we live under bad laws, but they're unequally enforced, it's very easy for those of us who are, who are not feeling the costs to ignore those who are feeling the costs of a bad regime. When we all live under the same laws and they're equally enforced, then we all feel the costs. 
and then, and then we all have a stake in changing those laws. And that's exactly what's going on with the drug war. Just imagine if the police tactics uh, in the inner cities uh, were being, the same tactics were used on college campuses in terms of, uh, you know, stop and frisk type things, and the number of people going through the criminal justice system. You know, I think, I think if the, the number of, of college students being caught with uh, a joint on them were, the, were, were uh, you know, the, the, if the policing tactics were, were the same, you would have a lot more people going through the criminal justice system on the, in, the college, uh, in the colleges, and you would have an instantaneous change in the policies at the state level. So it also, it also affects uh, you know, police militarization, it affects the loss of civil liberties, you know, so many of the, th of the complaints about the war on terror, uh, a, lot of those, a lot of those search and seizure type Fourth Amendment losses started with the drug war. And it's just a continuation along, along a spectrum. And it's really sad. Uh, you see the, the police militarization uh, bleeds into other areas of law enforcement. Uh, you saw that here in Charlottesville in April when six un, uh, plain clothed officers accosted three women uh, approached them very aggressively with guns drawn uh, and found out that she was only buying uh, auto, sparkling water, right? That's a serious problem. When you have these, these law enforcement uh, powers in bureaucracies that have one, uh, one issue that they're enforcing, you have a narrow-mindedness and a lack of proportionality. And in this, uh, this era we live in of, of aggressive police tactics, you get this, this uh, totally inappropriate police response or law enforcement response. So that's why I've, I've proposed taking law enforcement uh, powers out, out of the ABC bureaucracy, moving it to local police so that they have, they have to actually uh, have some proportionality and uh, determine the relative needs for, for enforcement of that law versus other laws. And by moving away from it, the war on drugs, you can actually also move uh, a lot of police enforcement resources to real, real crimes. We have a fairly low <laughs> murder clearance rate in the state. That's something that should be improved. We have a greater concern uh, over sex trafficking. That's something that police work should be prioritizing, not the war on drugs. So, this is a, so the war on drugs is a, a, a really important issue that touches on so many others. Uh, what else do you guys want to talk about? I guess I'll, I'll, I'll stop right there. I can talk more, but I'd rather uh, answer your questions if you have some. Yes? I saw you were a fan of a flat sales tax or, and drastically decreasing the amount of an income tax upon people. Wouldn't that create a very aggressive tax that will take out a larger percent of the income of the people on the lower side than the higher side? And wouldn't it be much better to create a tax that was graduated a sales tax graduated based upon the level of luxury, the relative le level of luxury. Wouldn't that be a lot better in a realistic world, and you'd be a lot be able to get more of the uh, liberal people in the state senate and et cetera to be able to be more fair? Yeah. So, so the the concern is is the standard concern over consumption taxes that they're regressive or not not progressive. So I have a few things to say about this. Uh, one is the income tax is important to move away from because. Uh, you know, it's a drag on employment, and especially in a, a low growth, low employment economy where we really need to put people back to work, getting rid of the income tax can have, or, or substantially reducing it, can have a legitimately uh, salutary effect on employment. Uh, you know, the income tax put, creates a gap between what an employer has to pay, the cost of employment, and the, uh, what an employee takes home at the end of the day. And so, so substantially reducing that can have a boost in employment. Uh, as for, as for the effects of a consumption tax, one of the things you have to realize is that the sales tax currently is, uh, it, it exempts all services. And this is a historical artifact. Of, uh, we started with a more manufacturing-based economy. We've developed a much more service-based economy, uh, but we never expanded the, the sales tax to include um, services. We also have other certain industries that have a lower sales tax rate applied to it. So, Poor people spend a much lower percentage of their income on or their consumption on say, uh, services. So, you know, expanding the sales tax to include services uh, alone will bring in a lot more money 
and uh, at least double the amount brought in by the sales tax, uh, probably more, and can pay for at least half of the income tax. So, so these are things that you know. It, it's it's not a standard it's not a standard uh, problem for for regressivity. I don't think. Uh, you know, it's actually it's actually can make it less regressive by expanding by having a uniform tax over all goods and services, retail sales of goods and services. Not only that, though, I think it's really important to not do spending and social uh, programs through the through the tax system generally. That's my general preference, and the reason is it sometimes makes it more difficult to understand where the benefits are going to and how much it costs. So, you know, I'm okay with, if we're going to have uh, preferential, or, or if we want some progressivity, uh, if we want to uh, take care of uh, people who are in dire straits, we can do that, we can have social programs, but let's make it an explicit, uh, an explicit program that, we, that is transparent in how much it costs. Uh, there's another aspect to it, uh, if you can think about some people like to, let's, let's not have a sales tax on food, for example. But um, you know, rich people buy food too. Rich people uh, spend quite a bit of money on food. Uh, it, does, it make, does it make more sense to, uh, if, if you're concerned about regressivity or progressivity, does it make sense to actually exclude food? Or does it, or does it make more sense to have some sort of rebate uh, with a cap on it? So that you know, uh, if, you, if you spend $100,000 on really fancy food, you know, you're not getting the, the benefit of a progressive tax rate, even though you're rich. So, yeah, I really question whether uh, it makes sense to, to do things that way. I, I, I strongly prefer a uniform uh, tax rate for on, on, on a consumption tax. And because once you move away from that, then you start getting every industry saying, oh, well, let's, let's get mine, let's carve out an exemption for my industry too. And then that just brings us back to the cycle where everybody's lobbying, wasting money on lobbying, trying to get special treatment. Obviously, well, one of the things that, uh, this is one of the things that we've just recently seen the federal government basically come to blows over over the past like two and a half weeks or so. And it's the thing about making sure that this whole affordable Medicare thing. So this is kind of, a, if you don't mind, a little bit of a two-pronged a two question in the, sense that, in the sense that when you look at what the main, what the current like, Senate Democrats and the House GOP is arguing, what the fundamental Republicans and the Democrats are arguing right now as far as like, health care policy, the question is what, do you think that, liber that the Libertarian plat the party, the libertarian Party's platform is superior to that by, by both Democrats and Republicans in making sure that those on the lower end of the economic spectrum can get basic life saving care? And I'm not, 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 not necessarily talking about anything excessive about anything, you know, on either, but you know, fundamental, like, you know, life saving care they'll need. Does the Libertarian Party think, in your view, make it so that more people on the lower, lower end of the economic spectrum can get this life saving care that they need, that more of them can do that? as opposed to what the other two parties advocate, and if so, how exactly does it achieve that goal, and how is it superior to what the Democrats and Republicans want? Yeah, so, uh, did everybody hear the question? Yeah, okay, so, yes, the Libertarian Party's approach to these things are vastly superior for a variety of reasons. Let me, let, let me start with the first one, which is that if you look at all the problems we have in the healthcare system right now, a huge amount of the problems trace themselves back to a, a fairly, you know, we have tons and tons of federal regulations. And, you know, if you're just looking at one, you can, you can trace a lot of pathologies in the healthcare system back to the tax exempt status of employer provided health insurance, for example. And there are others that we can talk about. But this one, one regulation or, 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 or historical quirk of taxation uh, so distorts the market that it has a lot of pro follow-on problems because of that. So, so for, for one thing, it ties our insurance to employment. That's not how insurance is supposed to work. When you lose your job, you lose your insurance. That's not a good thing. Second, um, oftentimes employers give you only a set of options in the, in the insurance policies that you can get under their, uh, under their benefits package. And that means that you have your, your, your choices are constrained and that limits the effectiveness of the of market competition in the insurance industry. So that also isn't good. Third, because, because the insurance benefits are tax exempt, 
you're going to, it, obviously, you would prefer as much compensation be untaxed as tax. And if you're going to be spending certain amounts of money on uh, health care, you're going to want it to be untaxed. So we push as much spending as possible through the insurance system. So then we get all of these, uh, um, you know, comprehensive coverage, uh, insurance, and that's not how insurance is supposed to work either. You don't get, uh, you don't have your auto insurance paying for gasoline and car and oil changes and things like that. But that's what we have with our system. And on top of that, we have a lot of federal and state mandates that insurance policies have to cover this, that, and the other thing. It drives up the cost of insurance, making it unaffordable to a lot of people. We also have, by, by, by pushing a lot of our spending through the insurance system, we get rid of price transparency altogether. So if you ask your doctor how much something costs, he has no idea. And you won't have any idea until you get the bill. And you might not even know if your insurance covers it until you get the bill. And that's not how an open and competitive marketplace is supposed to work. Price, without prices, we can't economize. And so not only, not only are we not economizing in what we demand, the healthcare we demand, but we're also, you know, we're driving up the demand because we don't pay the full cost when we see a doctor. And, you know, when demand goes up in a, in a uh, industry where supply is constrained, which I'll get to in a second, prices just keep going up and up and up. And that's what's going on. And so all of these regulations, just that one regulation, has a huge effect in driving costs up and pricing poor people out of the market entirely. So it's a huge problem. Um, I'll talk, I'll, let me talk about how it's constrained, because this is something that uh, Republicans and Democrats, I haven't heard a single one talk about licensing of doctors and nurses and the accreditation system for medical education. Um, if you look at, from 1980 to 2005, the number of MDs awarded in the United States was flat. 25 years, population increasing, med medical services, uh, demand for medical services going up and up and up. And we're not increasing the number of doctors we're graduating who are coming into the system. That's a serious problem. And, and one of the reasons is we make it very hard to become doctors. We do so by requiring uh, medical education to, to have you know, a certain amount of classroom hours, certain credits and this, that, and the other thing. And there's no reason to believe that this is creating a, a, you know, the optimal system of medical education. There's no price, again, there's no prices in medical <coughs> education. We, requ we, re we require funding of medical schools to come from a variety of sources which force medical institutions, medical educational institutions, to engage in a lot of behavior uh, activities that have nothing to do with educating doctors. Uh, and it basically constrains the system, as I said with higher education K through 12, to, a, to, to the status quo. So there's very little innovation in cost-effective education of our future doctors. Everything's done the same way it has been for quite a long time, with the exception possibly of some online services which are not, are not really uh, you know, real innovation in the sense that, that we could have in a much more dynamic marketplace. Um, so, that, so there's that. Same thing with nurses, physician assistants, pharmacists, and things like that. But it gets worse than that. Uh, doctors have a very strong lobby, the AMA. And each, each uh, state has its own equivalent of the AMA. And they're very savvy and powerful in keeping nurses from having expanded authority to provide more primary care services. So some states have gotten past this and have passed scope of authority statutes, uh, independent practice statutes. We have a fairly good prescriptive authority statute, but we don't have increased scope of authority in independent practice. Just a little bit quick in the deck. This, yes. this, 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 this is something I got to the bench notes. This is like one who want to provide to other people like on a lower end of the economic spectrum. Do you think specifically prevent nurses from doing just that? If the nurses want to, are you saying these AMA regulations get in the way of nurses who are being able to do this effectively? Is that what you, are, is that what you mean? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's so so that's, a, that's a major issue. We have a, we have a pilot program for certain rural areas that uh, if, if there aren't any doctors available within a certain radius, uh, then nurses can do some independent practice it's a, pilot, it's a very limited pilot program, but just think about it. It doesn't make sense. The same economics apply in an urban area where the number of doctors, uh, given the demand, 
prices a whole lot of people out of the marketplace or makes it really hard to get a, an appointment. So it's the same economics everywhere. Uh, we should just go ahead and let, let uh, you know, free up the system so that nurses, physician assistants, and things like that have much broader authority. So in, in so many, and I, you know, those are just a couple of regulations I talked about. There, this is one of the most heavily regulated industries in the entire economy. And every single one of those regulations, I, I'm not going to say that all of them are bad, but I'm certainly going to say that many of them are for the sole purpose of, or the primary purpose of making it harder to do business, increasing the cost of doing business, <coughs> increasing the cost of entry into the marketplace or into the profession. And it's, it's basically destroying the ability of the marketplace to function in the way that every other uh, marketplace does where we have quality improvements at lowered costs. So, uh, you know, so, so, so access is, is, is a major problem in part because uh, our government has, state and federal, have uh, basically increased the cost of doing business so great that we price people out of the marketplace. One of the reasons why poor folks, you know, people complain about poor folks showing up at the uh, emergency room, well, it's because they have nowhere else to go. You know, it's really hard to open a service, uh, a cost-effective service that these people can afford. Uh, you know, it's, it's possible to do in a more open and competitive marketplace, but in the system we have, it's, it's, it's literally impossible. Yeah. Could you talk about your view of the state's role in funding of higher education and making higher education more affordable to low-income students? Sure. Well, part of the problem uh, is that all the subsidies we have essentially get captured by the institutions by raising by the institutions by raising tuition prices, and uh, so so we've. We keep increasing the subsidies uh, through student loan programs and grants and things like that, and 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 it just gets, uh, and it just goes to fund you know, newer buildings. Uh, a lot of you know uh, you know tenured faculty have a fairly good life, things like that, and that's part 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 of the same story I was telling you when you subsidize something, but the demand the supply is constrained. I mean, it's very hard to open an accredited university for your university, uh, and. I'm not really sure that that's, that's, that, that's something that we should be uh, aiming for, is, is more of the same kind of uh, you know, institutions that have been around for a long time. So I think if we're going to have, if we're going to be trying to subsidize higher education, I think the, the, um, we should do so in a more intelligent manner, focusing on individuals uh, and not constraining where they can use their subsidies. But I really question whether the subsidies are appropriate at all. Um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of educational value and return on investment that should make it uh, quite possible to have, uh, you know, private private uh, arrangements where you know you this this happens a lot in Germany. This happens a lot in uh, engineering graduate programs. You don't see a lot of it in un uh, undergraduate at the undergraduate level, partly because we have uh, fairly generous uh, student loan programs and things like that. Uh, but, but where you, you're either an apprentice or you, you agree to work for a certain number of years after the training is over. Uh, but you know, this, is, this is really a, a difficult question to talk about in the abstract because, for one thing, it's, it's, it's really hard to picture what a dynamic marketplace in education is going to look like. For the same reason that you know, in 2006, if you asked what cell phones are going to look like in 2007, 2008, Nobody would have said that they looked like what the iPhone is going to be. That was, you know, com competition in a marketplace, uh, in an open, where there's oh, free entry and exit, creates such dynamic and innovation that oftentimes you can't predict where the future is going to be. And so when you talk about, you know, should we subsidize higher education? I mean, I would say no, that we shouldn't continue to subsidize at such at the levels we are the institutions that exist currently, because that's just going to create static, a static educational system. And what we really want to do is create a much more dynamic and flexible one, where we're not sending kids to schools that just keep jacking up their prices. What about affordability for low-income students? Assuming that we're operating under the current system, what do you think the state's role is in making college affordable for people who can't afford college? Well, if you're going, to, I mean, if you're going to have, if you're going to have affordability, um, I, I, th I think that if you're going to have 
these questions, you have to you have to move away from uh, these. I, I would I would much rather be subsidizing individuals than institutions. So one of the things let's look at let's look at kind of step back and, and look at what, what happens with young people. They go they graduate from high school or college. They get a job and then what happens? We take a fairly sizable amount of their paycheck to fund not just government services but generational subsidies to older folks. So if you're going to if you're going to have a system of subsidies, you can't have all of these generational cross subsidies where you take money from older folks who are working, subsidize young people to go to school, but then as soon as they get out, take, all their take a lot of their money and subsidize the older folks. So the best thing to do is actually to uh, you know, eat, get rid of those cross subsidies and then just have you know, a, a, a flat sort of uh, universal uniform tax and then provide some sort of subsidy to individuals, not tying them to how they can use it, uh, but they can use it in a way that educates themselves educate yourself, uh, and you know, poor people can use it in the same way, but when you, when you tie it to a system and you, and you have this, this accreditation system that, like I said, uh, cartelizes the education market, you're just, you're just gonna, all of those subsidies are going to go to the suppliers of the institutions, not to the person who is being subsidized. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? But they're getting an education. No, right. That's that's, that's, not what, that's not the point that I'm saying. What I'm saying is, you know, the subsidies that we have are increasing, but the tuition prices are increasing, so that people come out with more debt. So the same system is it, it's not it's not that we are taking away people's ability to go to school. It's that we're taking away the subsidies that just get captured by the ex existing institutions. And I would say the way we do education now, higher education is a vast subsidy to the wealthy. You know, that's something that people don't even realize. Coming to a place like this, the vast majority of students uh, are from the top quartile. Those are, that's a huge subsidy that you know, the tax system is paid for by all sorts of people throughout the socioeconomic status scale. And, but the main beneficiaries are rich people. So, so certainly, I think that you know, if you want to have a system of subsidies that that is most geared towards helping poor folks, then you definitely have to get away from this current model. Very much the same thing behind the school voucher mm -hmm. concept. It's the fact that it's like you'd be forcing like schools in order to be making pressure on schools to improve the quality of the education and giving and improve the affordability and improve everything and improve the whole institution. Because like, uh, they wouldn't have like they, they wouldn't have like you know any discounted bailout, so it would p p p place more pressure. So the same thing why like in Belgium, it's the same principle explained why in Belgium with the school vouchers. So so high school students are running like circle, are running circles around like American students. So thing, and this would basically work the same with colleges too. You know, if co if colleges if the subsidies are based on individuals, co colleges would be on, under like much more pressure to, to look at, at the most popular students from the middle class on down and say. We have to find better, better ways to make better scholarships and better grants and better ways so that all of them could like, very easily afford a college. The most qualified students would be the most beneficial to the job market and would gain the most out of going to college. The colleges would be under more pressure than they currently are to, 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 to come up with like, like, more merit-based ways to, to fund those students who belong in college to get the most of college and who are middle class on down without like, the most trouble affording it. Right. Yeah, th I think that's, that's right. And, and, and that's sort of what I mean by, you know, when, at K through 12, you know, moving to a system of vouchers or tax credits that puts hand, money in the hands of the individuals creates consumers who can go out into the marketplace and search for the service. You have to make sure that the, the marketplace for private schools is not then regulated to death, so that it becomes, as I was saying earlier, very hard to open a school. You have to pass through all these accredita accreditation standards, and then that effectively uh, limits the supply and then they just capture all the vouchers, and, the, and then you have to keep ratcheting up the vouchers. That's exactly what I, what I don't want to happen, and what we have to move away from at the higher education level, where we're focusing our subsidies, if we're gonna have them, on the individuals. And you can have, you can have an increasing subsidy for, for poorer people, so that you actually incentivize, as you're saying, uh, schools to go out and search for uh, the, you know, people who uh, wanna go to college from lower socioeconomic status families 
Um, but you know, that's all. That's that's all a, a question of you know, we have to move away from the status quo where where these where we're investing in these institutions that just are not doing what exactly you want it to do. It's just doing quite the opposite. Take one more question. Sure. Um, you brought up the issue of how lots of times laws are unfairly enforced, lots of times drug laws are unfairly enforced. How do you think that we should best deal with that issue? So I guess, I mean, it's, it's there, there's, well, that's a big question. One of them is, is make sure that the laws apply fairly equally to all of us in terms of as they're written. As it is, as it is there's so many uh, carve-outs for every rule out there, certainly tax and regulatory stuff. But but even the even the laws as they're written, um, but every, you know every you know we have in the Constitution a provision that says that you know every taxing authority uh, or every tax levied within a jurisdiction has to be uniform across the dis the, the jurisdiction in the sense that if the state government um, you know wants to wants to um, wants to have a tax, it has to be, it, it, you can't have, you basically can't have uh, certain jurisdictions or certain geographic areas paying more. And that's one of the reasons why there's some question about the, uh, the transportation bill, which has surtaxes for, for certain areas. Um, but, so, so, so we basically have to go through the entire legal code. I think we should have a commission that its sole purpose is to go through and get rid of all of those. But in terms of policing, that's an issue where um, it's, it's difficult to make sure that uh, that enforcement is the same across all jurisdictions. So, so it's it's not an easy uh, it's not an easy question to answer. And I don't I don't know that uh, you necessarily have to have uh, perfect equality because certain areas have different concerns in terms of you know you want you don't want if if there's a lot of crime in in one area you don't want to be um, spending all your resources on a lesser priority X, whereas in another area you don't have much crime, you know, you, you, you have more resources that you can spend on X. Uh, but it's something that it's uh, it, it's certainly it's certainly something where where absent absent you know absent any of those types of cross jurisdictional differences, you know, that then then you would expect the uh, the state level enforcement to be the same. Now local jurisdictions the local enforcement of, the, of, of laws, that's something that, you know, again, local jurisdictions have their own laws that they enforce, and it's totally appropriate that, you know, you move to a different place, the local authorities are more um, accountable to you, and that that and the local enforcement should be different at the local level. But, as, you know, state enforcement is something that, you know, needs to, needs to always be um, looked at from the standpoint of, of equity and fairness. Yeah. To me, real quick. Um, so I'm kind of in this situation with, I think, like a lot of people in Virginia, we hate both Republican and Democratic candidates. Um, why should I vote for you when, I mean, it's going to be tough for a libertarian to win in any election, opposed to voting for someone who I tend to lean more conservative, but other people tend to lean more liberal, like for a McCulloch or a Cuccinelli? Mm -hmm. I think there's a variety of reasons. One is uh, one is getting getting libertarian the libertarian party major party status is a, is a big deal because it means that a lot less resources have to be spent on getting onto the ballot uh, and more more resources can be spent on actually running a campaign. A lot of a lot a lot of uh, races seats go unchallenged every year. Having more people running. Uh, with more resources to, to suspend on their actual campaign makes a difference in terms of the the, uh, the issues that are being talked about, and it increases the cost of lobbying, uh, increases the cost of lobbyists to capture their legislator. Uh, but it also it also means that you know it, it makes it more likely that we will get a libertarian into office, and you know just one libertarian in office changes a lot about what gets talked about and the nature of the debate over spending and, and taxation and all these things. So it makes a big difference. And you know, every, every, the chance that, you, that your vote changes the outcome of the election is, very, is fairly minuscule. But every vote against the two-party system, against politics as usual, for freedom and, and the rule of law, is a vote that has to be reckoned with by the other two parties. And you know, if, if I can maximize my vote total, 
and it's a fairly impressive number, you know, the, the Republican Democratic Party and all the incumbents have to respond to that. Thank you.